In this section of the course, we're going to take a look at the state design pattern. So you might be wondering, well, hold on, every object or most objects have stayed in their fields, and so why are we even discussing it? Why is this a separate design pattern? Well, in the representation of the Gang of Four, the state design pattern basically suggests that the state of the system kind of controls the way that it operates, and it also ties to this idea of state machines or finite state machines. So what is the motivation? behind using the state design pattern. Well, if you consider an ordinary telephone, for example, then what you can do with a telephone typically depends on the current state of the telephone as well as the phone line. So for example, if the phone is ringing or if you want to make a call, you need to pick up the phone. That's a requirement to be able to actually respond to somebody or to actually make a new call somewhere. Now, the phone must be off the hook to actually talk to somebody or make a call. You cannot be talking to them while the phone is still on the hook and ringing. Now, if you try calling someone and the line is busy, then you put the handset down. That's a typical operation of the phone. Now, changes in the state of the system, so in our case, that would be the phone, changes in the state can be explicit so we can actually sort of specify, oh, by the way, we're doing this change, or these changes can be in response to an event. That's the typical observer pattern. So it's, it's really up to you how your state machine operates. So some state machines would have explicit control. So for example, you query the user what they want to do, and thereby they transition from one state to another, and other systems would run state machines based on events happening externally. So for example, since I'm in algo trading, what I typically have is I connect to a stock market and I listen to events which come from the stock market. So that is the observer pattern. And then I have a state machine which moves me from the connecting state to the connected state to the state where, where I got some initial market data and so on and so forth. So the state design pattern is quite simply a pattern where the object's behavior is determined by its state. So you have some state and it doesn't have to be a single field or anything. It can be quite expansive. And then the behavior which is possible, which is performed by the object, depends on that state. Now, the, there is also this paradigm of an object transitioning from one state to another. So for example, the phone can move from the off-hook stage to, let's say, dialing stage, for example. And this happens uh, to be called a transition, so you transition from one state to another, and sometimes these uh, transitions are triggered by some event. So we have this idea of a trigger as an event which causes a transition from one state to another. Now we have this formalized construct which manages state and transitions from one state to another, and that formalized construct is called a state machine. And once again, this is typically a class. It can be a class that you yourself build, or a class taken from an external library. And we're actually going to look at both of these examples. If you actually go ahead and you check out the state design pattern as it's implemented in the Gang of Four book, which I remind you was written in 1994, well, if you check out their examples, you'd realize that something is seriously wrong, that the examples in the Gang of Four book are not really the way that we do state machines today. So even though I didn't really want to show any kind of example which leverages state machines in the same way as they did all those years ago, I thought I would cover it as a kind of of academic exercise because the implementation that you're about to see is not the kind of implementation I would recommend. I would say that it's not just a case of over engineering but a case of bad design. But let's actually talk about it. What we're going to be modeling is a very simple light switch. Now a light switch has two states, either the light is off or the light is on. But the way that the classic implementation of the state design pattern handles the light switch, or indeed a similar concept, is a bit bizarre. So we're going to take a look at how we can implement this. So first of all, we're going to have a class for a switch. So a switch is going to have a bunch of methods for switching the light on and switching the light off, but the interaction with the state is going to be very specific, because in the classic implementation of a state design pattern, each state is a class. It's not just an enum member or some numeric constant, it's actually a heavyweight class, not something that I would recommend doing ever, even if you're in a situation where your states have to have lots of special behaviors, this is not where you put them. But let me show you how uh, this can be uh, this can be implemented. So typically what you would do is you would have some sort of base class, maybe some abstract base class called state, 
And this class would have uh, virtual methods for performing uh, the operations which kind of transition you from one state to another. So you would have, let's say, a, a, vir a, a virtual uh, method for turning the light on. And similarly, you would have a, a virtual method for uh, turning the light off. Okay, so uh, these two methods are going to somehow switch the lights but in actual fact the implementation of both on and off is also very weird i don't even want to fill it in right now because you're gonna find everything uh, to be a bit confusing so what we're going to do is we're going to inherit from this abstract state class and we're going to define our two states so we have the on state when the light is on and we have the off state when the light is off so let's have a class called on state so this is going to inherit from state and we'll have a uh, constructor. Uh, we'll have a constructor. Now, in the constructor, the assumption is that when you call the constructor, when you create the on state, you are, uh, let's say, you're, you're kind of entering that state. And there, uh, by the time you are at this particular point in code, the light gets turned on. So that's what we're going to write here. Light turned on. Okay, so this is probably uh, the end of the kind of obvious stuff uh, related to the classic implementation of the pattern, because now we're going to see complications. Now we're going to see a kind of bidirectional relationship between the switch, which is our control element, which allows us to switch from one state to another, and the actual states, which also, bizarrely enough, have their own on and off methods. So let me, let me show you how this can work. So inside the switch, inside the switch class, we're actually going to have a uh, variable, it can be a field or a public property, uh, which is going to store an instance of the current state. So public state uh, state equals, and we start with the off state, by the way. And I, have and I have constructed the off state, so let me just do it quickly here. So we'll have an off state. Uh, which is also going to inherit uh, from state. And let me define the constructor similar to the way we've done here. So here I'm going to say light turned off. Okay, so coming back down here, what we know is that the switch starts in the off state. You'll notice that there is a bit of polymorphism here. So the off state inherits from state. So the type of variable here is state. And as you may have guessed, at some point, the state variable gets replaced. So we replace it with an on state if we switch the light on. And then our light switch has the on and off methods. So uh, we'll have public void on and public void off. Now, what happens in the classic implementation of the state design pattern is that you tell the state to switch itself from one state to another. And what I just said is it sounds stupid and it it actually is stupid but let me let me show you how this can work anyway so we take the current state now remember this is a polymorphic call because uh the state class is abstract so these are virtual members you might be calling them in the on state you might be calling them in the off state you don't really know so you say state dot on and you pass the switch so once again if you are experienced in object-oriented design this might be a code smell for you like, why are we passing the control element into the state, which then mutates the control element back? It's a kind of bidirectional thing. And here you would do state.off once again, passing this. Okay, so as you can see, there are parameters here, and we need to add them. So here in the base abstract uh, class, we pass the switch. Switch as W here, and switch as W here. Now, what happens inside the default implementations because remember this is a base class what happens inside the default implementations is even more weird because what we're going to do here is we're going to say that light is already on and similarly here we say that light is already off so it's probably hard for you to understand why exactly we're doing this you'll only see uh, everything uh, once we get the full picture and the full picture we're going to get in just a moment, because for the on state, it doesn't make any sense for the on state to switch itself on, because it's already on. So the only thing you would implement here is you would override the off method. Override uh, the off method, and this is where you can say, for example, that we are turning uh, the light off, and we can actually 
uh, turn the light off. Now the way this is done is um, by taking a switch that got passed in as W, taking its state uh, property or field and setting it to a new off state. And uh, we can now do a symmetric operation inside the off state. So here we would override the on method. Here we would say turning light on and we would say that sw.state equals on state, a new on state, like so. All right, so this is our setup, and the, if you're confused by the setup, that's no problem. It, it, it completely makes sense uh, for you to be confused by this because it's far from intuitive. But let me finish off the demo first of all. So we make a light switch, var ls equals new switch. We can turn the light on, we can turn the light off, and we can turn the light off again, off again. So the light is already off, but we are allowed to turn it off once again. Okay, so how would this work? Let's try tracing our steps as we call something. So we take a light switch and we call the on method on it. So we call the on method on this uh, whole thing and let's see where we end up. So we end up in the on method here. What we do is we take the current state as it is and we tell the current state that we want to perform a transition from whatever state we're in, can be virtually anything, to the on state. So following this, we end up in the abstract base class on, and of course, this would have some implementation. So if we're starting out with the off state, then on will be called in the off state. So we come back here. Everything is okay. We The light was off. We are turning the light on. And then what we do is we take the switch, which is kind of like a user interface, a user interface effectively. So the switch here is the user interface. We take the user interface and we modify its state, but we don't modify it in the sense of just changing a numeric value or a Boolean value, which is what you would expect in this particular case. You would expect a Boolean to indicate whether the light was on or off. And you would say SW.on equals true, something like that. But here, what happens is we substitute a state object. We replace it completely with a new object of type on state. And then of course, when we call off here, the opposite operation happens. So we call off here, which does state.off. Remember the state is now an on state. So we end up here in the off and we turn the light off. So this operation does work. And now we come to calling off again. This is the interesting case. This is the unique case of this example, because when we call off, the light is already off. We are already in the off state. So when we call state.off, off state doesn't have an off method. It doesn't have an off override. It has an on override, which is not our case. So where would it find the off method? It would find it right here. And that explains why in the base class, um, in the base class right here, rather, why you would actually have the on method telling you that the light is already on and the off method telling you the light is already off because if you're in here or if you're in here you're trying to repeat a state that you're already in you are cycling the state you're not moving to a different state you're trying to get into the same state once again which is why we don't do the overrides when so these methods actually get called now let's run the entire example let's just run it and let's see what we get okay so as you can see, initially light turned off, then we are turning the light on and the light is turned on. We're turning the light off and the light is turned on. We're turning the light off and the light is turned off. And then we are trying to turn the light off again, but the light is already off. So that is our scenario. So I'm including the scenario here for completeness. This is not the way that we build state machines nowadays. And in actual fact, if you didn't know, if you didn't do any analysis on this entire demo, you wouldn't know what's going on here because the whole implementation is very unintuitive. First of all, it's wasteful. You don't really need to have every state modeled by a class unless you really want to, unless there is a lot of logic that has to go into the state. But typically the logic goes not into the states, but into the transitions between the different states. Now, unfortunately what happens here is the transitions themselves are handled inside the states themselves. So when you flick on the switch, this does nothing but call the appropriate method on the state, which from just a purely perceptive, uh, perceptional perspective doesn't make any sense because when I 
When I have a particular state of an object, I don't invoke behavior on that state. I invoke behaviors outside. Maybe I take my hand and I press the uh, switch. So that is my behavior. That is the behavior of the switch. It's not the behavior of the actual state. So this entire demo is basically just a historic and academic demo. They, certainly it does work. It does function. And there's even uh, trickery with the virtual method so that if you are cycling a state, if you're already in a particular state and you end up in that same state again, you have some specific outputs here in the abstract base class. But apart from that, this is not the kind of code I would recommend. And uh, we're going to take a look at much better implementations of state machines. Typically, state machines are constructed using appropriate state machine libraries, but we're going to look at how to implement one yourself. So we are not going to use any external library. We'll just have a bunch of states and then a bunch of transitions between those states. We're going to orchestrate the entire state machine. So what I'm going to emulate is a phone call. You pick up the phone and you dial a number and you can be talking to somebody or you can be put on hold, something like that. So for this system to work, we need two things. We need a set of states such as the phone being off the hook or connecting or being placed on hold, and also a bunch of triggers. Now, triggers are simply events that happen in the system, like, for example, when you dial a call. You dial a call, and so you transition from the phone simply being off the hook to the phone actually connecting to whoever you just dialed. So we're going to implement all of this, and we'll begin by implementing the states. So I'm going to have an enum called state, and we're going to have four states. We're going to have off the hook, we're going, to have a state for, we're going to have a state for connecting, another state for connected, and another state for on hold. In addition, we're going to have a bunch of transitions between those states. So we're going to have transitions such as call dialed, we'll have uh, hung up, hung up, we'll have call connected, uh, placed on hold, uh, maybe taken off hold and left message if you leave a message on somebody's answering machine. Okay, so this is how we uh, implement uh, the uh, state as well as the triggers. So these are going to be part of the trigger enum, and now we're going to string this all together. Now, as you may have guessed, what happens is you transition from one state to another using these triggers. So we're going to make a dictionary, which is going to store all of the transition information. So private static, dictionary. So we're going to transition from a state to a set of possible states dependent upon their trigger. So here I'm going to make a list of pairs of trigger and state, like so. And this is all going to be called rules. So that's going to be a new, this big massive dictionary, and I'm going to initialize it in place as well. Okay, so let me just explain once again what's going on. You're in a particular state, and for that particular state, what you can do is you can get a list of all the states you can transition to, together with the triggers which are required to transition to that particular state. So for example, if you're in the off-hook state, what you can do is you can tr transition to the connecting state as you dial a number and actually try to connect to somebody. So here we define a list of possible trigger and state pairs, and there's only one in this case, and this is where you dial a call, so call dialed, and what happens as you dial the call is you're now in the connecting state. So this is how you define the state machine, and you're going to have, have more of these definitions. I'm just going to paste a few of them in because, well, we don't have time to type them all in. So here are a few more, like if you're connecting, then you can uh, transition to an off-hook state if you hang up, and you can transition to a connected state if the call is in fact connected. So we have a bunch of these rules, and now we can orchestrate the state machine, so we can actually run the state machine and see how it works. So we're going to begin with an initial state, var state equals state.offhook, and from then on we're going to make an infinite loop so I'm going to have this, and there is no terminating condition in my state machine. There is no condition where you actually hang the phone back on the hook. So we're going to have this infinite loop. And first of all, we're going to specify what state we are actually in right now. So I'm going to write line, and I'm just going to say the phone is currently and then specify the state, and then we're going to date, and then we're going to give the user an option to select a particular trigger. So I'm going to write line, select a trigger, 
there we go and then of course we're going to have some sort of for each iterating all of the possible transitions which can happen from the current state and that's essentially ac accessing the dictionary by key and getting the list of possible states so it, it's rather easy to do so we're going to say for each and we're going to go through all of the uh, rules sorry that should be in here we're going to go through all the rules at the current state and here i'm just going to call this uh, var uh, x for now but of course we also might want to show the index so let's actually convert it to uh, some sort of four and uh, gonna get rid of this for now so we're gonna have a ordinary for loop and then I, I only want the transition I don't want to tell the user what state they're going to transition to to offer the set of transitions so we're gonna say var t and then ignore the state equals rules at state at index i so this way you get the actual uh, transition and then we can write line the transition so we can write line uh, for example that we have the index which is i dot and then the actual transition so this is the set of transitions you have and you get to pick one of them so we capture the input we say int input equals in dot parse console dot read line I'm not doing any error checking here but uh, time is short and then I will get the state that we can transition to so var underscore s equals rules at state at input so we got the input from zero to however many transitions are possible and we get the state for this transition and we set the current state to the state that we got and this is an infinite loop so let's actually run this and let's see how the whole thing works our whole thing works all right, so the phone is currently off the hook and I get to select a trigger. There's only one trigger right now. We can dial a call. So I select zero and then the phone is currently connecting and maybe the call did get connected, in which case we take a one and the phone is currently connected. So we can either leave a message or we can hang up or we can be placed on hold. So if we are placed on hold, then the phone is currently on hold and we get to select a new trigger like the phone may be taken off hold. And then of course, what I can do is I can leave a message and then uh, the phone is off the hook again. So I left a message and now once again, I'm back to the starting state and I can dial a new call if I want to. So this is how you can implement a very simple state machine without using any external libraries, just by making a dictionary with a list of all the possible transitions and then orchestrating the whole thing so that you transition from one state to another. All right, so what we're going to take a look at now is a much simpler way of defining state machines that doesn't involve a centralized location where you define the transitions between different states. So we looked at a way of defining transitions in a single dictionary, which kind of defines all the starting states, the triggers, as well as where you end up with, but you can avoid that completely. So we're going to look at a simpler scenario. We're going to model a combination lock, and that combination lock is going to be in one of three different states. So we're going to have a state locked that's when the combination lock is actually locked we're going to have the state fail that's when you enter an incorrect code and so we should print fail on the screen and then the unlocked state that's where you enter the correct code and the combination lock is actually open so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to define first of all the code that opens the lock i'm also going to define the initial state so let's call this state locked state locked and then uh, I'm going to define the entry. Now the entry is going to be a sequence of digits that the user has tried to uh, enter as they are actually opening the lock. So I'm going to have a string builder uh, modeling this particular thing. So we're going to have a string builder like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a state machine, but I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to make an infinite loop. So it's going to be a while true. And inside that loop, I'll have a switch on the state. So we're going to handle each one of the states right inside this loop. So I'll generate the different labels here. Now we don't really need the argument out of range exception because we know we are limited by the three possible states defined here. And so let's actually implement them. I'm going to begin by implementing the failed state. That's when you enter an incorrect code. And so the lock tells you that you have failed, but maybe the lock allows you to type in stuff once again. So let's actually, first of all, uh, the word failed. I'm going to make the word uh, erase whatever the user has actually entered. So I'm going to say console dot uh, cursor left equals zero here. So I'm going to go back to the start of the line and then I'm going to overwrite the word failed over the actual digits that the user tried to enter. I'll clear the entry 
So that's the entry that the user has uh, been accumulating, the digits that were meant to open the code. And then I will set the state to state.locked. Okay, so after this, what happens is if you fail to enter the correct code, what happens is that uh, we print failed, but then we clear the entry and set the state back to locked so you can try entering the code again. And this is the place where you would, for example, count the number of failed attempts and then correct them somehow. So uh, in addition to this, let's implement the unlocked state. That's the good one. That's when you finally manage to unlock the whole thing. So once again, the whole thing. So once again, I'll say uh, console.cursor left uh, equals zero, console.right line equals, uh, well, console.right line unlocked in this case. And I'm going to return from the program because, well, there's nothing else to demonstrate, is there? Now, the locked state is the one that's interesting because that's where we actually get the user's input. So uh, we have this string builder called entry, which actually keeps every single digit. So we append to that entry the user's input. So we say console.read key. So we read a single key without waiting for the uh, line break for the carriage return to be entered. And we get the key char from that to actually put into the string builder. And then of course we can compare the string builder with the code. So if entry dot to string is in fact uh, equal to the code, then what we can do is we can say that the state is unlocked in this particular case and uh, just uh, break from here. Now, another case, you need to make sure that the user keeps entering the right digits. So if the code does not start uh, with uh, the string builder entry, that means the user has entered an incorrect digit. And so we set the state to failed. So we say state equals state dot failed. And that's pretty much it. All right. So as you can see, we are in an infinite loop, which means that as the states switch from one to another, you keep coming back to checking every single state inside the switch statement and uh, performing the appropriate calculation. So the program is actually done. And this is something that we can actually run right now and see what the output is. All right, so here we are, we have uh, this input panel. Now, if I type one, two, three, one, notice it overwrites failed. If I type a six, that writes failed once again. If I say one, two, one, that says failed. But if I say one, two, three, four, it says unlocked, which is what we wanted in the first place. So the takeaway from this demonstration is that it's not always necessary to define in terms of some sort of dictionary or some sort of formalized structure, because in the case of a switch that you keep going through again and again and again, you can actually get the transitions as simple assignments here. Now, another thing that you can do in addition to having an infinite loop like this is you can actually jump from one case of the switch to another case of the switch. And this is also very interesting because essentially what you can do at any location, like for example, here, the state is failed. And let's imagine there is no infinite loop. What you can do now is you can say something like the following. So instead of doing this, for example, you could say, uh, go to case state.failed because guess what? C sharp allows you to jump from one switch case to another and thereby you can uh, orchestrate the entire state machine as a set of transitions from one switch case to another switch case, which is also very possible. Of course, it involves the use of the evil go to keyword, but I don't mind. I think that in this particular case, I don't mind. I think that in this particular case, it might be warranted. And the upside of this implementation, as opposed to having a dictionary full of transitions is you can do other things besides, and everything is kind of human readable. You have your case, the case is indented by two spaces, as you can see here. And in the case, you can actually read what's going on and you can sort of follow the code along instead of you know having to jump to some formalized structure that exists somewhere else so it's certainly well and good to use uh formalized structures or indeed external frameworks but if you have a very simple state machine like the one here then perhaps having a uh, switch uh, is a more palatable more understandable approach In the previous lecture, we looked at a rather clumsy way of setting up an infinite loop with a switch inside it. But even though that approach is probably not a good approach, there is a good approach which actually uses the switch expression, not switch statements, switch expression, that's an important distinction. And it uses a switch expression in order to informally define a state machine. So let's imagine that you are in 
to treasure hunting and you find a chest. That chest can be locked or unlocked and you can perform certain actions on the chest. So the states that the chest can be in are as follows. The chest can be open, the chest can be closed, and the chest can also be locked. Locked implies, of course, that the chest is closed, but it's also locked, which means you have to have a key. Now what we can do is we can define the kind of actions that we can perform on the chest. So we can open the chest and we can close the chest. And now what we can do is we can use uh, the switch exp we can use uh, the switch expressions syntax which is available from C# -sharp 8 onwards to basically just define a method which defines all the transitions using uh, the switch expression syntax. So in case you're not familiar with how it looks, let me show you. So we're going to have a static method which returns the state of the chest after some transition. So we're going to manipulate the chest and uh, when we manipulate the chest, we need to know about the current state of the chest. We also need to know about the kind of action that we want to perform on the chest. And finally, uh, let's suppose we have an additional boolean indicating whether or not we have the key to the chest. Have key. Like so. Okay, now, uh, since this is a switch expression and not just using a switch statement, what you'll see is instead of using curly braces as you would in an ordinary method, this is an expression. So we're going to use expression, which means there is an arrow here, just as we have arrows for expression uh, methods and expression you know, properties and all that sort of thing. So it's basically a simplification. Now, what we do here is we do a switch, but we do a different switch. We don't say switch which, uh, whatever. Uh, instead, we take all the arguments that we want to pattern match against, and then we perform the switch. So we want to pattern match against all the three arguments, so we want to take a look at chest, action, and have key. And uh, here we write the switch keyword after we specify what we are actually uh, want to investigate. And here comes the curly brace. So now, um, our formatting is a little bit broken, that's not my fault, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at different sets of values, and for each set of values we're going to define which state we are transitioning to. So let's suppose that the chest is locked. The chest is locked to, let's say, open the chest. Now opening the chest when it's uh, locked is only possible if you have the key. So if you have the key, if this value is true, then we are in fact unlocking the chest and the resulting uh, state is open. There we go. So this is a nice condition. Now imagine the chest is closed, just closed, not locked, and you want to open it. So here you would say action dot uh, open. Now in this case, uh, it doesn't really matter whether or not you have the key because the chest is closed, it's not locked. So here we put an underscore because we don't really care. And the chest is going to be open anyway. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at a situation where the chest is open and we want to close it. Now there are actually two cases. If you have the key, then you, the chest goes into a locked state because you've locked it with the key. Because you've locked it with the key. But if you don't have the key, if the value here is false, then it simply becomes closed. So here is our state machine. The only thing that's missing is some sort of default case. Now, why would you want the default case? Aren't we covering all the cases here already? Well, not really. Imagine if the state is open and somebody wants to open it. In this case, nothing should change. Nothing should happen here. So there's going to be an additional underscore case, the kind of default case or catch all case, where we simply return the current state. So we transition from the current state to the current state. Basically, nothing happens here. So this is our switch expression. You'll notice that it's different to how ordinary methods look. It's completely different because typically you would have a switch inside the curly braces and here you have the switch and then the curly braces. But this has allowed us to informally define the state machine. So we have, as we did before, a set of the states where in the possible are up with. And we also have a guard condition here. So have key is a guard condition. So it's an external dependency that the state machine sort of checks at runtime in order to figure out whether or not a transition is possible. So it looks at this argument as well and makes its decisions accordingly. And we have a catch all case just in case somebody tries something that we haven't accounted for. So with this state machine defined, let's actually simulate it. So I'll have a chest that is initially uh, locked. And then uh, let's just output uh, lo lots of states here. So the chest is 
uh, chest we output the state and then we can unlock the chest with the key so we say chest equals manipulate so uh, we manipulate the chest we want to open it and we have the key so i'm putting a value of true here now we can say uh chest is whatever state it is in now let's suppose that we decide to just close the chest not lock it just close so i say chest equals manipulate equals manipulate once again chest here action would be closed and i don't have the key so it's going to be a false here uh we can once again output the state and now let's imagine that i'm trying to close it again so the state is already closed after i do this but i try to do that same thing once again and we get to see what's actually going on here okay so let's actually run all of this let's take a look at what we get here okay so as you can see initially the chest is locked then we uh, open it with a key so the chest is open then we close it without using the key so the chest is closed and when you perform the close on a close again nothing changes the state is still the same so it tells us that the chest is closed now, what we've looked here is the use of a guard condition. What we haven't discussed here is uh, any kind of action, any kind of behavior that happens when you enter a state or when you exit a state, that sort of thing. And if you want to have this sort of thing, then, un then unfortunately you have to give up on the nice switch expression syntax and you have to go back to an ordinary switch statement, which means that you would uh, typically regress back to something like this. So you would have some manipulate too, which uses just an ordinary switch. So the syntax here is not as nice as the C sharp eight syntax up here. But what you can do with this case is in the default case, for example, you can uh, perform additional actions because unfortunately what happens in the switch expression is you return a bunch of values. You return a value here, you return a value here. So there is no place here to place, let's say a console right line. Now, of course you could try to massage it somehow. You could make wrappers so that in here or in here, you would both invoke something, both maybe output something to the command line and return a value. So it is quite possible, but uh, uh, if you really want to have lots of behaviors as opposed to just formally defined transitions, then this approach, the approach with uh, having just an ordinary switch statement is probably the approach that you want to go for. So uh, this uh, kind of approach is uh, also valid. It's also something that you can use to define state machines. But once again, the downside here is that there is no formal definition of a state machine available for introspection, which means there is no data structure which clearly defines what the states are and what the associated transitions are and what the guard conditions are. So you cannot inspect uh, this set of patterns externally and let's say make a report or draw a diagram on the basis of this. So this is a limitation, but uh, on the other hand, it's very nice syntax. Once again, using the pattern matching approach is a uh, very uh, very good looking. So if you have simple state machines that do not require things like documentation and whatever, then you can use switch expressions uh, from C sharp eight and they will make your plot nicer to read. All right, so now that we've looked at how to construct a state machine by hand, we're going to look at one of the many ways in which you can construct a state machine using a library solution. So in this case, I'm going to use a slightly less politically correct example of a state machine, and we're going to take a look at, guess what, reproductive health. Because, well, it's also an important topic, so that's what we're going to look at. Now, this time around, if we look at the Nugget references, let me go into Nugget packages for a moment, you'll see that I'm using an external Nugget package called Stateless. And Stateless is an implementation of a hierarchical state machine, uh, which is a, it's a library written by Nicholas Bloomhart, who is also one of the authors of the Autofac container, which I use personally. So that's what we're going to use. And I've included the nugget package here so we can start using the state machine. Now, once again, we're going to define two enumerations. One is going to be the set of states that you can be in. So let's, you know, let's say since we're doing reproductive health, I'm going to call this health and we might have uh, non-reproductive, maybe you're too young and then uh, pregnant and then uh, reproductive. So these are the three states. And then there are a couple of things you can do in order to transition from one state to another. So let's make a bunch of activities. So there's something that you can do in order to move one state from another. For example, uh, give birth, you can grow older 
or maybe, I don't know, reach puberty. That's better. And then have an abortion. Sorry, but that also happens. Have unprotected sex. And uh, maybe have an operation uh, to remove all the reproductive parts because they're so terrible. Me. Sorry about being so macabre, but this is, you know, real life, so I'm having a real life scenario here. Okay, so we're going to make a state machine using this stateless library. I'm not going to orchestrate the state machine, meaning I'm not going to do the please input your current state and please input the transition kind of stuff that we did previously, but I will show you how the state machine works. So you basically define a state machine, uh, let's call it just machine, and this is a new state machine. And notice it takes two template arguments. The first is the state and the second is the trigger. So the state in this case, it's going to be health and the triggers are activities uh, that you can do. So activity like so. So this is the state machine, but having made the state machine, uh, we also need to specify the starting state. So here the initial state is going to be, well, let's have non-reproductive to begin with. Okay, so now that you have this, what you do is you configure the set of transitions from a particular state to a set of other states. And the way this is done is as follows. So you say machine dot configure, and then you specify the state that you want to transition from. So the entry state. So for example, if you are in a non-reproductive state, then you can transition to a reproductive state by reaching puberty. And the way this is done is by using the permit method. Now, as you can see here, there is a ton of customization here in terms of the kind of things that you can do, for example, permit re-entry and stuff like that. So state machines are really complicated topics. And in actual fact, you could do a separate course on how to design state machines and make them do all the things that you want. I'm only covering the design pattern here, so I want to show you how it works. So essentially we permit the transition to a reproductive state, assuming that you reach puberty reach puberty and you transition to a reproductive state. So this is how you would how you would uh, define a transition. And then of course you can do dot permit and you can specify an additional transition. And after you uh, have a couple of transitions, you may end up uh, with something like the following. Let me just paste something in here that I've prepared already. So um, yeah, that should be machine. So let's have state machine like so and i'm gonna change state machine so and then this uh this should be slightly less ambiguous okay so what do we have here well most of these are just permit but some of these are conditional like for example permit if means that you can transition from uh, whatever state you were, reproductive, to a pregnant state if you have unprotected se sex, but the condition is that your parents are not what they are. They'll probably tell you to use protection. So here you can uh, make a uh, make a property, for example, Boolean property called parents not watching, and you can be dependent upon it, which means that the transition will only occur, it's only possible, if this Boolean has the value true. If the value is false, then you cannot transition from reproductive to pregnant. So this is a, once again, a small overview of how this is done in the real world. So you probably don't want to write your own dictionary. You probably want to use a, an external library of some kind. And uh, certainly Microsoft has some libraries. Microsoft has this thing called Workflow Foundation, which is a bit over-engineered. I like the stateless library. So this is a small example of how you use it.